Good afternoon, boys and girls. It's your friend Shane T, who is sitting around in the office on a Friday afternoon. Uh, and I have an update on some things that I've been working on lately. Uh, many of you may notice that I'm, I've gone down this rabbit hole or wormhole, depending on how you look at it, of uh, ignition energy testing. And I'm trying to find a way to quantify without running something on an engine you know, one coil versus another, the output energy of one versus another. Uh, and up to this point, I've had a lot of opportunity to test a lot of different kinds of coils on my test apparatus. I'm not gonna waste time showing you that apparatus, but effectively it is a calorimeter, which means that it, it measures the temperature of a known mass of a particular metal, in this case, uh, as you fire the spark into it. So I have um, converted an extra MoTeC M800 into a uh, into a, effectively a test bench with a little uh, wiring harness, if you could even call it that. It's a nasty spool of wires thrown all over my desk. Uh, and using a combination of my lab scope and the Pico scope and the M800 software, I managed to reconfigure the M800 to trigger itself uh, and to do this test. So, if it, the way it works is that the uh, the test uh, starts by sparking the coil, I'm measuring uh, the temperature of the mass that it's firing the spark into. So the spark plug fires into this, effectively a temperature sensor, uh, which is grounded, so the secondary has a place to go to ground. Um, and the temperature is measured over a particular test time at a particular test frequency. Um, and by doing that, then I can come up with an energy, total energy measurement from raising the temperature of this fixed mass over time. I know the amount of energy it takes to do that. I can divide by the total number of sparks, and that then gives me the average energy per spark. Uh, so I've been doing that for a while, testing only uh, coils on the bench again. But I recently had the opportunity to run an engine on the dyno uh, with a race grade, a set of race grade IGN 1A coils. And uh, because the tuning went well, uh, I was able to play around with, with dwell time. So what I actually did was, you know, normally I would just run the dwell at the peak output, uh, peak output charge timer. So the coil is fully saturated no matter what the battery voltage is. But because we had a little bit of extra time, I decided to try and reduce the dwell time, like less than full saturation and see if there was a obvious difference on the engine. Now, the engine in question is a turbocharged engine running methanol, uh, M1 methanol, uh, non-intercooled, so it runs fairly rich. I was able to run back-to-back -back pulls on the dyno um, at the same horsepower output, but with two different dwell settings. So we ran the same battery voltage, uh, the same mixture aim, 0.64 lambda, um, it's the, the RPM where we ended up testing to was about 6,800 RPM. So I simulated that RPM on my ignition test bench here on, on, in the test apparatus. Um, same voltage, again, uh, 55 pounds of boost. So this was a, a reasonable test for something that you might actually use. And the, you know, the curiosity was what happens if you start reducing the dwell time down? What, what's the result? Uh, so the result on the dyno was effectively the same horsepower. It was 1,900 horsepower one way and 1,885 the other. Uh, that's within the measurement variation of the engine, the dyno, and all that stuff for the time that we had to test it, which was basically two back-to-back -back poles. So I'm calling it effectively the same horsepower, same boost. Um, everything else is pretty much identical, the difference being the two dwell times. So again, this is a race-grade IGN 1A coil. What I'm going to do is attempt to flip this thing around without knocking it off its stand. Right, then we can zoom into the laptop potentially. Whoa, it zoomed way fast. Let's go like that. So what we're looking at is the result of my test on the test bench. So what I did is I ran through the data from the dyno and I looked at the battery voltage for both dyno poles. Again, it was effectively the same. We didn't change anything there. Uh, and, and, and then the two different dwell times. And what you're looking at is the result of my testing on my test bench where I run the coil at the, uh, at the current, at the, the voltage level that's indicated on the screen 
for the dwell time that's indicated on the screen, for the number of sparks that are indicated on the screen, and the resultant energy is then puked out on the right-hand side. On the left side, the graph that you're looking at, the purple line is the actual temperature change from the start of the test to the end of the test. Uh, and and those, that's the temperature change of the two different settings on this uh, coil that I tested, which is another race grade IGN 1A coil. On the right-hand side of the screen, uh, you see basically the temperature of the coil itself. So I'm measuring the heat sink temperature with an infrared temperature sensor during the test uh, so that I can attempt to try and equalize things if I'm testing multiple different types of the same or multiple different coils that are the same. So I can test the same coil at the same temperature and make sure the output's the same. Uh, so in this case, because we're using more energy with higher dwell at 10.8 milliseconds, we find that the heat sink temperature is going up on the coil, which you would expect. You're charging the coil more, you're asking more from it, it's getting hotter while you're doing it, and that's what you see with the purple line on the right half of the screen. Again, on the left half of the screen, the purple line is the temperature of my spark mass that I'm firing the, the coil and the spark plug into, and then I'm measuring the rise in temperature of that mass over time and number of sparks to determine the spark energy per spark. Uh, so that's what we're looking at there. The, the middle number you see here, uh, microseconds, is the burn time. So what I do is I measure the burn time with a lab scope, uh, looking at the secondary voltage, and then enter that value into the MoTeC so that I have that value as part of the data. Because um, if I just run two coils back to back, uh, and measure the temperature rise of the sensor, or the spark mass in this case. Um, if you think about it, if one coil is actually sparking for a longer period of time than another, over the, a certain number of sparks, it's going to have a better opportunity to heat up that, that sensor. You know, if, it, if it's duty cycle, if you want, of spark time versus not spark time uh, is 20%, and another coil is 40%, the coil that sparks at 40% is going to have a better opportunity to heat that, um, that mass up because uh, it's, it's putting heat into it for a longer period of time. That doesn't necessarily mean that the output of the spark uh, would be higher. Uh, it just means that it sparks for a longer period of time. So what I do is I measure the spark duration and then I take the total temperature rise and, and divide it by the inverse of effectively the duty cycle of the spark time so that if I have a super high output, hot, very short spark, that very well could be 100 millijoules of energy over that short period of time. But it's going to look to the temperature sensor like it's not much of a difference because the temperature is not going to rise that much. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of normalizing by the amount of burn time uh, just as a way to try and equalize the energy and get them to come out with the same value. For example, when you test a CDI ignition, a CDI ignition doesn't put much heat because the spark is so short, the temperature rise isn't that great, even though the ignition energy during the spark is still 100 millijoules. So that's just my sort of half-assed way to equalize how I'm, how I'm doing this. Anyway, um, okay, so the, the other thing I wanted to show was uh, this was the actual me measurement of the energy I got at these two different dwell settings on my test bench after I ran this engine on the dyno, which once again, equal power, equal lambda, equal engine speed, uh, same boost, same battery voltage, two different dwell settings, 10.8 and 4.9. So um, the, the other thing I did was just looked at the, uh, the, what the charge time looked like on the Pico scope. So if we take a look here at the screen, let me make sure it's centered up. Yeah, okay. So. What we're looking at here is this blue trace. This is the actual amperage going into the coil when it's being charged, okay? And this red line here is the signal from the ECU telling it when to charge the coil, right? And then this is discharge. And this uh, sort of yellow line at the bottom is the secondary uh, ignition output. So I'm just looking at the voltage going through the spark plug wire. So uh, you can see it's low during the charge period and then we discharge the coil at this point I make the assumption you can see that maybe I better point with my hand or something else because maybe you can't see the arrow. So over here, this vertical line is where uh, we, we decide to, to fire the coil and make a spark happen. So here's where we charge. The current ramps up slowly until it runs to its peak and then we fire the coil here. The secondary voltage 
uh, goes way up to jump the gap. And then you see, this is sort of just noise in the trace from the way I'm doing all this stuff with it, like hundreds of wires wrapped around each other. This is the burn line here of the secondary. Now, it's not in a real engine, so in a real engine it would be kind of wiggly because it's not stable, but because it's just firing in air, it's a pretty stable looking curve. And then over here is where the spark stops. So your total burn time is from here to there. So if we just measure that, and this is with the uh, dwell set at 10.8 milliseconds or whatever it was when we ran full output at this lower battery voltage on the dyno. So let's see, if I put the cursors on those two points, the delta is about 3.75. So it takes about 3,750 milliseconds, uh, th microseconds rather, 3.75 milliseconds to discharge the coil in the spark gap, right? When it's charged at 10.8 milliseconds and whatever this battery voltage is. So now let me open up the other test I did, which was simulating four point, that's not open yet. Right, so you can see how much different that, that is, right? So it's obviously charged for a lot less period of time, 4.9 milliseconds. We get the cursors back out again here. Look at where we release the coil compared to where we start charging the coil. Yeah, 4.9 milliseconds differential. Same thing, here's the secondary down at the bottom, down here, right? Spark at this point, burn, 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 burn. The burn ends right here. So let's see what that burn time is. All right, and that burn time in this case is about delta three milliseconds. So. We had about um, three quarters of a millisecond less total time burning at that output, 4.9 milliseconds worth of dwell time, which according to my test bench is about 75 millijoules worth of energy. So I just thought that was interesting. I finally had an opportunity to close the loop as it were uh, and, and test what I'm doing on the bench versus what I see on a real engine. And, uh, haven't had the opportunity to do that so far. So, so that's, uh, I thought I would share that. I thought that was interesting. This goes back to the whole concept that as long as you have enough ignition energy for the minimum required ignition energy to initiate spark consistently, having more ignition energy doesn't give you any benefit. So in this case, we're able to go from uh, 100 millijoules to 75 millijoules and, and suffered no performance uh, advantage or disadvantage on the engine on the dyno. So uh, sort of like if I, uh, if I was doing my engine tuning and I was testing the ignition advance and I ended up with the same horsepower at 20 degrees of ignition advance versus 22, I wouldn't waste my time running 22, I would run 20, right? So the same thing, if I can run uh, 75 millijoules worth of ignition energy and end up with no penalty for doing that, I would definitely do that because at the very least, I'm gonna heat up all my components less, uh, less wear and tear on, on uh, the electrical system in general because the current that the electrical system has to supply to all the coils will be far less uh, if, you're, if you only require 75 millijoules. Now, I, I wasn't, there wasn't scope in, in what I was doing because I wasn't supposed to be there to test coils. I was supposed to be there tuning an engine and I kind of just worked this in at the end. Uh, so there wasn't scope for me to continue to turn the dwell down or throttle the ignition output to find out where we had some sort of performance loss, you know, a misfire or perhaps a variation in the mixture or some other indicator that it, it wasn't happy with the amount of ignition energy we were using. It could be that the engine in question only requires 45 milliseconds. It's back to the, 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 the same sort of um, long, long talked about uh, theory, which I believe is correct, which is that if you, as long as you exceed the minimum ignition energy for whatever it takes to initiate stable combustion consistently, more ignition output doesn't give you anything. Um, so what does this mean? I don't know what it means. I just thought it was interesting. And uh, since my buddy Paul's in Thailand uh, on vacation, I'm not sure the guy ever works anymore. Uh, I thought, of course, I would wear the shirt that he sent to me and do another video, and I thought this would be a little bit of an interesting concept. So if you enjoyed it, definitely share it. You can follow along with my exploits on, obviously, Facebook at Shane Tecklenburg or Tuned by Shane T. Uh, you can follow me on uh, Instagram, Tuned by Shane T, 
on X, Tuned by Shane T, uh, and YouTube, Tuned by Shane T. Imagine that. Uh, so anyway, if you enjoyed it, share. I hope you got something out of it. I definitely did. It's interesting, if, if nothing else. And uh, yeah, happy Friday, and I think that's all I got. So thanks for watching.